So welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today. My name is Olivia Brown. I'm the Community Programs Coordinator for the Mercer Museum in Font Hill Castle. And I'm delighted that we can bring this lunchtime presentation to you all um, virtually, whether you're in your homes or taking a break from work today. You know, it's a gloomy fall day outside, but it's great to be able to uh, learn something in the middle of the week and, and take some time to uh, join us today. And we really appreciate having all of you here. I am very excited for today's program, Henry Mercer as Collector. Um, and before we get started, I will just take a moment to familiarize all of you with the Zoom platform. You will recognize that, um, or see that your videos and audio have automatically been turned off, but we do have the Q&A feature. So if you need to contact me, um, or if you have questions throughout the, the presentation, you can use the Q&A to um, ask those questions and then we will go over them all at the end. If you're having any problem with hearing or technology, you can also put it in the Q&A and I'm happy to help you as well. The Q&A is located on your Zoom toolbar, which for phones and computers is located at the bottom of your screen. Um, and for tablets should be at the top as well. So that's where you can access that Q&A if you um, want to put any questions in the chat. Like I said, the program is going to um, last about 45 minutes to an hour, and then we will have plenty of time to answer your questions at the end. Um, so I will be able to read those questions off to our speaker today. I am very excited to introduce our speaker. Um, many of you have attended other lectures, virtual lectures with us, um, and will recognize Corey Amsler, the Vice President of Collections and Interpretation here at the Mercer Museum in Fonto Castle. Um, today is a wonderful lecture about the Mercer Museum collection, and no better person to give that talk than our Vice President of Collections. So without further ado, I would love to turn it over to Corey um, and I hope that you all enjoy the talk. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to uh, get the slides up here. And everyone should be able to, uh, to see the first slide here. You know, I've, I've given this talk a few times before, but never, uh, never on the Zoom platform. Um, and uh, hearing that folks are from Doylestown, from Lake Harmony, and all the way out to the West Coast, it's obviously a great opportunity uh, to sort of extend the reach uh, of, the, uh, uh, of our programming uh, well beyond the walls of the museum and the, and the confines of Doylestown as well. So uh, thank you all for attending. Um, uh, and we're going to jump right in here. Um, so I begin here uh, with this photograph, a uh, disorderly pile perhaps of Watsons, um, an array uh, of the hand tools and objects that Henry Mercer said in 1897 that he had heard of, uh, but never collectively saw before the objects that he would encounter on a chance visit to the shop of one Charlie Lehman, a Doylestown, Pennsylvania junk dealer. So why hadn't Mercer considered or seen uh, these objects, early tools and objects of everyday life in early America? Well, he was, first of all, uh, removed in time from a lot of these things. He'd been born shortly before the Civil War. He came of age uh, as America was becoming an industrial powerhouse, shifting from an early craft and agrarian economy to an industrial and commercial one. Um, he was also removed in class uh, from these things. He had been brought up in a middle-class family, uh, in a middle-class home. He had not gone to work in the fields, in the workshop, or the factory. Um, and so a lot of the things that he began collecting and he stumbled across were foreign to him. Um, they were a mystery, a what's it, uh, for which he sought to comprehend uh, its original use and its meaning. So the program uh, here today is not intended to be a biography of Mercer, uh, but rather it's a study of his collecting vision, a bit about his collecting ideas or ideology, um, and um, his methods uh, of collecting. Uh, in his era, Henry Mercer combined multiple streams of thought. Um, historical, anthropological, 
archaeological, ethnological, and brought all of these together to create his own unique statement on the past and its uses, which was realized ultimately in the construction of the Museum of the Bucks County Historical Society, today's Mercer Museum. So the year 1897 was a watershed year for, for Mercer. When it began, he was still curator of American and prehistoric archaeology at the University of Pennsylvania Museum, a position he'd held since 1894. He'd been with the museum since 1891. And the Penn Museum's original focus was, and in fact still is, on archaeology, anthropology, and the folkways of various global cultures. Uh, the Furness Building, the Frank Furness Building that's seen here, was the first home of the University Museum, uh, and it was the building that Henry Mercer knew uh, at, uh, at Penn. Uh, and this is what the interior of that museum looked like uh, in Henry Mercer's time. Um, the years between his education at Harvard in the 1870s and his work uh, at the Penn Museum uh, were Mercer's formative years intellectually. Um, this was a period, there was a lot going on in America on uh, the latter part of the, the 19th century. Uh, the country was achieving great progress in industry and intellect, uh, even as social critics began to lament a bit of a decline in emotion or ritual and what they might call called primitive instinct. There were nagging doubts that in all of America's material progress, something essential and elemental was being lost. And the study of so-called primitive cultures, whether Native American or those seen elsewhere in what we might call today the third world, was seen as a bit of an antidote to this notion that America had become over-civilized. It was also an era when objects frequently in the form of commercial goods were celebrated as evidence of progress. They were viewed increasingly uh, as essential and objective uh, sources of knowledge with some sort of transcendent value. The standard form of the 19th century museum, and you see it right here uh, in the Penn Museum, was to place everything on display with minimal labeling or what we might call today interpretation. Uh, one was meant to look at the objects and simply derive meaning from them. It was also a time when museum curators, Mercer among them, were consumed with classifying their collections, whether of natural or human-made origins, according to scientific systems. Now, one of Mercer's contemporaries and associates of the University Museum was this fellow, uh, Stuart Kulin. He was an influential member of the American Folklore Society and curator where he directed the exhibits and later uh, became curator at the Brooklyn Museum. Another friend of Mercer's and a colleague of Kulin's was Smithsonian ethnologist Frank Cushing. Cushing once said that both he and Kulin have an idea in common, that is, the making of stories out of all of these things. And Henry Mercer would come to share that common idea as well. Indeed, working with these and other thought leaders at Penn offered critical experiences for Mercer, influencing his thinking about history, about archaeology, folk life, storytelling, and the use of the object <clears throat> as evidence. But as it turns out, Mercer didn't always get along with all of his colleagues at the University Museum. Frictions grew, and so he decided uh, to sort of take his toys and go home uh, to back to Bucks County. So in 1897, Mercer, a Bucks County native, decides to leave his post at the University of Pennsylvania, return to Doylestown, and here he begins to shift his attention to historical matters uh, from the very distant prehistoric past to the more recent historical past. And sometime prior, just prior to 1897, he found this sign painted by the Quaker folk artist Edward Hicks uh, in the attic of a store in Taylorsville, Bucks County, where it had rested uh, since a flood destroyed the bridge at Washington Crossing in 1841. He's learning, Mercer is, that archaeology may not only be a below the earth or below ground uh, enterprise. He can find things above ground uh, as well using the same sort of archaeological um, uh, uh, pursuits. At about the same time, he happens to visit the junk shop of that fellow, Charlie Lehman, one of our fellow citizens, as Mercer said, who is in the habit of going to country sales. In this moment, when Mercer found 
this pair of fireplace tongs, and so much more in Charlie's shop. Uh, flax brakes, straw beehives, tin dinner horns, spinning wheels, he said, and more. This was, according to him, the launch point of his collection. And now, not long after, following an initial flurry of collecting activity and the labor of classifying what he'd found, Mercer presented his first exhibition, seen here, the tools of the nation maker at the Bucks County Courthouse in Doylestown. Recounting this uh, history and reflecting on it about 10 years later in 1907, Mercer would claim that the Bucks County Historical Society was at that point ahead of everybody, original, alone, and unique among historical institutions. Interested not simply in the rare, the unusual, or the object associated with the famous person of Vander Place, but he was interested in the most essential objects of an America that had only recently passed away. So from this local beginning, exemplified by the weather vane from the old Doylestown Agricultural Works, just a stone's throw from today's Mercer Museum, Mercer would begin collecting in ever widening circles. And some artifacts were easy to obtain for a price, uh, as noted by this receipt from local antique dealer Harry Worthington, which Mercer buys a stove, a rocking chair, a churn, uh, some frames, and a chest of drawers. Uh, Mercer said that, um, hey, well, others, I will say, provided uh, greater challenges. Uh, Mercer said that he was only able to get many of these things by pleading, urging, begging, and buying. In the case of this sign uh, from Bedminster Township, Bucks County's Elephant Hotel, Mercer had to agree to have a replica of the sign made in order to obtain this original. Um, and here's the receipt uh, for the new sign board that Mercer had painted, uh, which until relatively recently still hung at the old Elephant Hotel. Now I understand uh, it has been put in storage in hopes that the hotel may one day be restored. I'm not sure quite where that stands uh, today. So let me make uh, four points uh, with respect to Mercer's collecting, uh, which derived from uh, multiple points of view. First, it combined the historical with the scientific. So-called scientific history was an import from Germany, uh, insisting on facts rather than just romantic narrative, although Henry Mercer was deeply interested in romantic narrative. Um, Mercer also, though, insisted on classifying the historical artifacts he was collecting in a nod to the systems then being employed in the natural sciences. Second, Mercer's collecting foregrounded technological and material change as key indicators of historical change and human progress, which is not surprising given the explosion of material goods in the late 19th century. Remember, this is the same era of the, the Sears Roebuck catalog of the, the department store's growth uh, in American popular culture. And third, Mercer's collecting focused on common everyday stuff, uh, those things utilized by the common folk. And this was an approach that was being derived from what was called the new history, which was being practiced by historians at the University of Pennsylvania and elsewhere. And fourth, Mercer's collecting was multidisciplinary. It drew on the fields of folklore and folk life studies, on archeology, span on ethnology and aesthetics, and placed all of them in the service of history. So first, let's talk about folklore and folk life. Uh, in Mercer's uh, approach to collecting, Mercer said he wished to gather information about the uses and meanings of the object he was collecting directly from those who had once used them, i.e. the folk. Uh, when he acquired this jug, a form traditionally used for the storage of liquids like vinegar or whiskey, uh, he also collected a story about workmen mortaring such jugs into stone walls as a teasing joke on the stonemasons who frequently carried their whiskey jugs to work. This food storage pot is one of the most common forms of utilitarian earthenware used for various storage purposes, but particularly in Pennsylvania, apple butter. And in collecting the pot, Mercer also noted the traditional songs and customs of the apple butter frolics in the 18th and early 19th centuries when collective work and socializing were frequently combined together. 
Mercer accompanied uh, the entry for this artifact uh, in his 1897 Tools of the Nation Maker catalog um, with a note about uh, how he had found instances of the use of such gourd dippers from West Virginia and elsewhere and uh, right in uh, his home county of Bucks. Mercer approached collecting too from the standpoint of archeology, span what can be learned directly from the observation, comparison and inquiry, and from the context in which an object was found. This door latch, essentially an architectural fragment, um, an archeological fragment, uh, was plucked from the summer kitchen door of the so-called Kramer house uh, that Mercer explored in Rock Hill or possibly Hilltown Townships, Bucks County. Um, archaeology uh, can be defined as the systematic recovery and study of the material evidence remaining from past human life and culture. And Mercer practiced this systematic collecting and recording above ground just as he'd once practiced it uh, as a dirt archaeologist. Uh, in this case, uh, he documented historic hardware types and architectural elements from their original datable building contexts. Archaeology is also the learning often from very small things, a nail, a needle, even a small child's shoe found behind a fireplace in a farm outbuilding or workshop, uh, as in the case of this one. And for Mercer, an old house was in fact an archaeological site to be investigated. Such archaeology allowed Mercer to combine his romantic imagination with some degree of scientific detachment. Mercer interpreted this stick uh, found in an old house on Buckingham Mountain in Bucks County as a counting device used by an illiterate carpenter to record days and half days worked according to the full notches or half notches uh, on the stick. Henry Mercer also approached his collecting from the standpoint of comparing the customs and traditions of various nationalities and ethnologies. Uh, he wrote, here in Bucks County, we might expect to trace the leaven of various transatlantic ingredients of nationality, which by degrees should be detected amongst a group of objects fashioned by Dutch, uh, English, Dutch, Irish, or German hands. In the objects he was collecting, he sought to identify what he called their manifold elucidations of nationality. And yes, Henry Mercer was a wordy guy. Um, as he continued to collect, for example, he became especially fascinated with German-American material culture, uh, material traditions brought from Central Europe with German and Swiss immigrants to Pennsylvania and elsewhere in the 18th century. This tra additional instrument, um, whoops, these, tradition, whoops, these traditional instruments um, uh, were uh, many of them, uh, Scheitholz or zithers uh, that uh, were brought from Europe uh, by German immigrants and eventually were transformed uh, into the Appalachian dulcimer, which you see it right uh, on the settee here. In the 1920s, uh, Mercer took this interest in ethnology a bit further, uh, expanding his vision and collecting to include tools of other global cultures, not only uh, just the ones that made their way to the Americas. He arranged with a missionary, Amandus Johnson, to collect materials in Southwest Africa, including what was then Portuguese Angola, which is how this African knife and how uh, under hundreds of other uh, related objects entered the collection. And uh, another associate, uh, Rudolf Hummel, uh, led an expedition to Asia in the 1920s, financed by Mercer, and that helped Mercer to collect and acquire tools and other artifacts from China. Uh, contacts with missionaries in Korea also aided his collecting of Asian artifacts like this chalk line reel, a very different form than such tools brought from Europe or derived from Anglo-European models like this chalk line reel. And although Henry Mercer's primary interest was the way people used everyday implements to meet their various wants and needs, he was not by any means insensitive to aesthetics. In fact, it was the artistry of some of the earliest collections that caught his attention. Uh, Pennsylvania German stove plate patterns, or in this case, 
uh, Pennsylvania German decorated manuscript material or Frachter. Um, he respected the artistry inherent in traditional crafts like pottery. And of course, Mercer himself was an artist and ultimately a tile designer. Like his fellow arts and crafters in the early 1900s, he adopted the idea that the pre-industrial artisan had somehow imbued his or her products with life and liveliness and that machines and machine production uh, as America was industrializing had deadened these traditional lively arts. So in the arts and crafts of the Pennsylvania Germans, Mercer believed he had found the closest American approximation to this craft ideal, what he often referred to as the, as the Middle Ages or the medieval period. In fact, a lot of these things really owe their origins more to the Renaissance than the Middle Ages, but that's where Mercer rooted um, his interests. He saw them not just as works to be admired or even emulated, but also as evidence of the great historical and technological changes that had occurred in his own lifetime. In his Tools of the Nation Maker monograph in 1897, Mercer wrote about pottery, uh, as in the case of the illuminative, illuminative art of Frachter, to which the heart, tulip, and bird designs of the potter bear a striking resemblance, we see that we are dealing with a reflection of the art instinct of the Middle Ages. The fresher from Germany, the better the work. He lamented that this artistic instinct had faded away in his time, but he saw an opportunity for its revival in the beginnings of the arts and crafts movement. He said, let the free character and life of the individual be expressed in such an art with as little to do with the mold, the stamp, and the machine as possible. Now, Mercer collected these tiles, uh, which he used to embellish his home, Font Hill, with the same idea, a reverence for the aesthetics of handcraft and a celebration of the work of the traditional artisan, as well as, of course, for historical documentation. So Henry Mercer approached his collecting from these various perspectives, folklore, archaeology, ethnology, and even aesthetics to create an object-centered way of looking at history that was his own. And it's important to understand that this new way of looking at history was the central preoccupation of Mercer's life and carried over into all of his activities, including his tile production. Now, Mercer did not simply stop with collecting or accumulating objects. Instead, he sought understanding and explanations for their very existence. And this process required some strategies for documentation. So among Mercer's arsenal of research techniques supporting his collecting um, was the photography of individuals practicing various trades, crafts, and farm labor. And these were incorporated into three photo albums assembled in the late 1890s by the Bucks County Historical Society. In Mercer's own words, he wished to seek out those individuals who remembered and who could explain what these things mean, not just what they did, but what they mean, what they meant. And here's a tin dinner horn um, that uh, is exactly like the one that was being demonstrated in the photograph that Mercer took um, that was in one of the uh, scrapbooks from the 1890s. Now, Mercer was also one uh, of the first museum founders to organize demonstrations of historical crafts and trades, a process probably born out of his familiarity with folk life studies and also the work done by early ethnologists like, uh, like Frank Cushing, who I mentioned earlier, who often sought to recreate the activities and life ways of primitive and pre-modern peoples as a means to understand them. In Mercer's case, he asked the local resident, and this is Horn, uh, to demonstrate the use of a hand uh, grain corn or mill that she remembered from her native Ireland. And the photographs were taken here, obviously, uh, in the Mercer Museum. George Washington Krauss, who was born in 1866 and was a member of a, of a family of horn workers, uh, even came to the museum to demonstrate for the Bucks County Historical Society at Mercer's request. Uh, this is one of Krauss's combs, and there is uh, Krauss uh, and a younger member of his family uh, at the lower right. 
and to help direct his efforts and shed light on the origins of the collections in which he was interested, Mercer also relied on a number of individuals in the local community. He noted that he had begun to collect what he called valueless masses of obsolete utensils that had been preserved among us due to the existence in our county of several unthanked and non-mercenary hoarders. One of these hoarders, and apparently an important source of information, was a fellow by the name of Tobias Nash of Warmansville, Bucks County, where Mercer found the saddlebag in Nash's large collection. Uh, Isaac Gross, the grandson of Jacob Gross, who had come from Germany around 1783, was another of these community informants. Isaac, who was born in 1821, provided information about the use of the box brillet a sort of dunce cap or punishment device, goat spectacles uh, 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 in the German translation that were once used uh, in the local Mennonite schools. Mercer also experimented uh, in some cases with the crafts and trades he sought to better understand. Uh, this jar was made uh, at the Herstein Pottery in Ferndale and Ferndale in Nakamixon Township. Uh, with the Hersteins, Mercer sought to rediscover glaze recipes and techniques used in traditional earthenware production. So Mercer went out, rolled up his hand, rolled up his sleeves, and went to work as a potter trying to learn the potter's craft. And he worked uh, with the Hersteins in an effort to reproduce traditional earthenware. Uh, although not particularly successful in reproducing uh, the ware, his triad approach uh, did help him to learn the processes. And as such, it was not just an aesthetic effort, but a method of historical research. Uh, prints and engravings uh, were yet another documentary source. Mercer collected thousands of etchings, engravings, and woodcuts, some he used simply to decorate his home, Font Hill, but others were employed uh, to help document the origins and dates of certain forms of material culture. Mercer found this very early handsaw in the gardener's shed at Buckingham Friends Meeting House. The saw was even stamped with the name of the maker, P. Berger, possibly a Dutch or North German craftsperson. To Mercer's great surprise and excitement, Mercer noted a virtually identical handsaw, which can be seen here in the bottom of this uh, engraving, um, in a uh, book, uh, a Dutch book of trades published around 1700. This visual evidence helped to locate his Buckingham find both in time, that is the late 17th or very early 18th century, and place, uh, probably Northern Europe. Now many of the rooms in Mercer's home, Thought Hill, uh, contain volumes of his very extensive library. This is the study uh, at Thought Hill. Even his books were tools of research. That he read or perused the vast majority is proven by the extensive margin notes that are preserved uh, in various volumes. And Mercer frequently engaged in rather one-sided conversations with authors and grew frustrated uh, when the writers did not tell him what he wanted to know. Uh, in this particular volume uh, Mercer, that Mercer describes as useless, uh, he decries that the author's not providing sufficient facts about household manufacturers in the United States, 1640 to 1860. And here, uh, Mercer refers to the author as a baboon, uh, a favorite epithet uh, when uh, he is not being told what he most wants to know or learn. And another common criticism uh, is that uh, the volumes are not well indexed uh, and so difficult to locate information that he's looking for uh, in, uh, uh, in the books. Mercer also relied on, on dealers and antiquarians. Uh, when he was not able to locate artifacts directly from the source, he utilized a broad network of antiquarians, junk dealers, antique dealers uh, to build his collection. He maintained an active correspondence with these folks who often contacted him if they thought he might be interested in something they had for sale. These were American pickers uh, in Mercer's time. 
The downside with these purchases is that often Mercer could not identify the original context from which an object had come. So he was even further removed from the collecting process uh, than he had been early on in his collecting. These objects become types, but they're not really archaeological finds anymore uh, in quite the same way they were when Mercer was doing his uh, uh, direct collecting um, in uh, old houses in Bucks County. Uh, this wagon jack, uh, dated and initialed by its maker, was among the objects purchased from E.D. Zimmerman and listed in that uh, invoice. Uh, Zimmerman was a Monterey, Berks County dealer. Now, in 1912, Henry Mercer purchased this red earthenware baking dish from Francis Moreau at the Fountain House in Doylestown. Until recently, it's been the Starbucks. Uh, among the collectors who frequently uh, who frequented uh, Moreau's shop were those who were building their own museums like Henry Ford and Henry DuPont and Winterthur, uh, as well as well-heeled dealers and connoisseurs like Israel Sack of New York City. Moreau furnished uh, the inn with antiques and was encouraged by Henry Mercer to go into business uh, as a dealer. And the sale of the contents of the inn in 1928 brought many collectors and antiquarians to Doylestown. Here's Moreau's receipt for that covered dish and other objects purchased by Mercer in 1912. Now, clearly, H.K. Dicer's, Dicer's business was not uh, just antiques. Uh, he was in the business of ribbed underwear. Um, but... Um, but he was another of the pickers and dealers frequented by Mercer to root out uh, early American tools and other artifacts from Pennsylvania's communities. And in this way, Mercer again extended his reach into other areas of Pennsylvania and beyond. Um, for example, this, uh, this uh, Peter Porringer was acquired uh, from Deicher. Uh, it was probably made, oops, probably, there we go, oops. Somehow I missed that, but there we go. It was probably made by Roswell Gleason in Massachusetts uh, in the early 19th century. And so one thing that's important to recognize is that objects being collected by Mercer in Pennsylvania uh, might have had other origins. Ibrahim H. Rice of Bethlehem was one of the individuals who often accompanied Henry Mercer on his so-called stoveplate hunts uh, just prior to World War I. Uh, Rice was a fellow antiquarian, uh, and Mercer relied on him to help locate examples, rescuing many of these iron artifacts before they entered the scrap drives of uh, the World War I years. Now, Mercer may not always have been able to distinguish between objects originating in the colonies or the states in, in America uh, from those who may have been brought or imported to America from Europe. This spice mill acquired from Rice is likely of European origin. Mercer also relied on a number of assistants. Uh, Frank Swain, who Mercer would later rely on to manage the tile works and who would marry Mercer's housekeeper at Fod Hill, Laura Long, began working with Mercer in the 1890s. And Swain traveled around the US as Mercer's eyes and ears when the latter was no longer able to go himself uh, due to his health issues. At an antique shop in Boston, Swain paid 40 bucks uh, on Mercer's behalf for this racetrack tout uh, cigar store figure uh, in 1917. Horace Mann was uh, perhaps Mercer's most influential and intellectual assistant who continued to maintain Mercer's vision for the collection long after uh, the latter's death in 1930. Mann, in fact, um, served as curator until his own passing uh, in the 1950s. And Mann, uh, among other trips, made, uh, made a journey to the Appalachian region in Western North Carolina and Eastern Tennessee uh, in 1917. And among the artifacts he was instructed to acquire was a Norse mill, a type of grist mill that took advantage of the small, fast-moving mountain streams in Appalachia. Mann noted that he had made the trip into the North Carolina backcountry entirely on horseback over mountain trails. Along the way, he'd stayed with Mo uh, Amos Capps, a resident of the backcountry who operated one of the mills. And Capps sold Mann his mill for 40 bucks, which was a great deal, considering that Mann noted that another of the hill dwellers uh, was asking $500. So here's uh, that mill uh, in, uh, uh, 
ultimately when it came back to the Mercer Museum, also called a tub or a corn mill. It was built around the 1850s and probably intended to grind corn for whiskey making. Essentially, it was a turbine uh, directly driving the millstones uh, and a device that was believed to have been brought by Scots-Irish immigrants or potentially uh, French Huguenots uh, to America. Acquired on an earlier trip south by another of Mercer's assistants, William Labs, who happened to also be Mercer's foreman in the construction of the Mercer Museum, uh, is this trade figure, the cigar store figure from Charleston, South Carolina. So Mercer cast a pretty wide net. And once collecting was well underway, Mercer needed to develop a system for classifying and exhibiting his finds. In 1888, George Brown Good, who was Assistant Secretary of, uh, Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, wrote that museums should be houses full of ideas arranged with the strictest attention to system. A Mercer created his own system, which he illustrated in this chart, Historic Human Tools. First, he considered everything made by human hands to be a tool, that is, to have a specific function and meet a certain need or want. And he used this system to classify the collection, which informed his organization ultimately of the Mercer Museum itself. This was how Mercer sought to explain the collection to visitors and demonstrate what he referred to as its scientific importance. Now here's one type of tool which Mercer would have classified probably as a tool for food. That is, its task was to hold a stone for sharpening and honing the blade of a sickle or scythe uh, used for cutting grain, ultimately, uh, the grain making its way into flour and, and bread. And here was another type of tool, uh, a, a tool of advertising, a trade sign advertising uh, a hatter's shop in Nazareth, uh, Pennsylvania. So the Mercer Museum, or as it was called in Henry Mercer's time, the Colonial Museum, or simply the Museum of the Bucks County Historical Society, was simply another attempt to render order and to classify the collections. Think of it as a kind of giant file cabinet with lots of little cubbies. And the museum's design also reflected Mercer's hierarchy of primary versus secondary tools of humanity. It was constructed, of course, as many of us know, by eight men and a horse named Lucy uh, between the years 1913 and 1916. And Mercer described the museum in his own words, not as a gathering of souvenirs, relics, or antiques intended to arouse the collector's envy or the dealer's avarice, but a classified record of human progress shown by the tools of industry. Interestingly, Henry Mercer didn't... Um, didn't establish any period interiors, nor did he make any effort really to recontextualize the objects in the museum. Rather, uh, his exhibits offered the opportunity to compare and contrast a rich array of artifacts, essentially devoid of their original context. He did record, though, what he knew of an object's history in the museum's catalog registers, and he hoped that scholars would consult these as they sought out the collection for research. This is a, an early view of the museum's uh, earthenware pottery exhibit. Despite Mercer's forward-looking scholarly and scientific interests, the museum and its collection is also very much a product of his times. Uh, in their celebration of material accumulation and display, they manifest what's been called the culture of acquisitiveness uh, in the late 1800s. Both the department store and the museum uh, of this era, era were essentially similar celebrations of American material culture. Yet for Mercer, uh, this is likely an unconscious or unintended result. He was concerned primarily with knowledge and with telling stories, not consumption. As it turns out, Mercer was dismayed that museum goers seemed to be more curiosity seekers rather than serious scholars, historians, archaeologists, anthropologists. It was those individuals who he hoped to attract, but it was those individuals who mostly stayed at the university and as Mercer failed to bring them in his time to the museum. Oops, what happened? 
So Mercer's larger scholarly and romantic, uh, scholarly purpose, romantic though it sometimes could be, tends to separate him from many other collectors of his era, Henry Ford, Henry DuPont, uh, John D. Rockefeller, uh, Electra Havemeyer Webb of the Shelburne Museum in Vermont, and many others. Uh, some of these folks um, had social purposes or they collected entirely according to aesthetic appeal. Mercer's efforts uh, were recognized by the Academy and honorary degrees uh, conveyed by Franklin and Marshall College in 1916 and by Lehigh University in 1929. In many cases, Mercer contributed the first serious studies of singular forms of material culture. His first catalog of the collection attracted considerable notice. The publication reflected both his penchant for classification as well as his roots in archaeology and folk life. It was synthetic. It combined folklore and archaeology and placed them again in the service of history. And his text reflects the use of technological benchmarks reaching from the recent past back into antiquity. And that approach shows him to be very much in step um, with the historian Frederick Jackson Turner, who viewed early colonists' efforts to transform a frontier wilderness as formative in creating the American character and democratic mindset. He foregrounded artifacts like the axe as the master tools with which settlers contended with the forces of nature and dug up and utilized the riches of the soil. In the tools he was collecting, Mercer saw both continuity and change. He could place a stoneware lard lamp like the one uh, in the upper left corner here that he found in Eastern Tennessee on a continuum of historical and technological evolution that reached back to the ancient oil lamps from Athens and Cairo uh, at the bottom right. Now, also in 1897, Mercer researched and published uh, what he called the Illuminated Manuscripts of the Pennsylvania Germans, the first study of Pennsylvania German fractor or embellished manuscripts, baptismal certificates, decorated book, uh, book plates, uh, writing samples used for instructional purposes. This happens to be a Frachter artist paint box that Mercer was able to acquire and determine the original origins of. This is the one-time parochial school at the Deep Run Mennonite Meeting House in Bedminster, Bucks County, and it was an important link in the Frochter tradition. Here, Mercer found evidence of the use of Frochter in teaching and made contact with former teachers and students who recalled the practice of Frochter, of which uh, this religious manuscript is an example, probably by uh, Isaac Gross. Uh, the Isaac Gross, who, uh, whose name is on the manuscript, born in 1807 and who died in 1893. And this was the first, again, scholarly, scholarly study. It was really Mercer's first scholarly study. And he saw the Frock tradition, tradition as a link to the illuminated manuscripts of the Middle Ages. Pennsylvania Germans were his folk heroes, whose conservatism led them to bring these traditions to the New World and continue their practice well into the 1800s. Now, originally published in 1915, the Bible in Iron documented Mercer's discovery of the stoves and stove plates of the Pennsylvania Germans, again, demonstrating his interest in Germanic material culture in America. And he didn't have to look far initially to collect these plates. This one, a section of so-called Five, of a side, five, so called five plate stove is attributed to Durham Furnace in Durham Township, Bucks County. Another purpose in, in Mercer's collection, uh, collecting, was uh, as inspiration for his own arts and crafts era tile making. And this is Mercer's direct interpretation in tile of the stove plate he had collected in the previous slide. And this one, among the various er very earliest tiles produced in Mercer's fledgling Moravian pottery and tile works around uh, 1898, this was when uh, Mercer first began digging clay at Point Pleasant in Bucks County, and he was firing his ware in a rented kiln. Eventually, uh, this led to a larger operation, first at Mercer's family home, Aldi, and then later on what we know today 
uh, at the Moravian Pottery and Tile Works, built in 1912. Now, Mercer's stoveplate hunts uh, that he went on with A.H. Uh, Rice and others uh, led also to his interest in the old buildings in which they were found. He discovered that he could date structures according to the form um, appearance and the technologies uh, represented in the hardware and other elements of these historic structures. And that led to his monograph, The Dating of Old Houses, originally published in the journal Old Time New England. And this latch, like much early house hardware, was imported from England in the 18th century, uh, not made here. Mercer's fascination with this house and his desire to obtain the unusual latch from the front door led to an interaction with the artist and photographer Charles Sheeler. Mercer desperately wanted the, the latch from this door. Sheeler was renting the house, uh, which was not far from Font Hill, um, and uh, Sheeler refused to let him have it. It wasn't until um, Frank Swain, Mercer's assistant, purchased the house after Sheeler vacated it that Mercer was finally able to get the unusual latch from the front door. The pattern of this X developed to cut down the great forest that confronted Europeans coming to the New World was America's contribution to tool design. This and other woodworking tools Mercer wrote about in another one of his scholarly studies, in this case the 1929 volume, Ancient Carpenter's Tools. And by this time, Mercer was taking great pains to recognize that the tools he was collecting represented not just an American story, but a global one as humans everywhere toiled to develop the tools they needed to confront their basic needs and wants, whether that was food or clothing or shelter and so on. Now, along with his father, Edward, Nathan Good, whose name is on uh, this uh, plane, was one of the carpenters that constructed the Buckingham Friends Meeting House in Lahaska, Bucks County. While the tool had a local history and Mercer was interested in local history, he was chiefly concerned with representing and interpreting the use of such tools to meet, again, one of the most fundamental needs of humanity, that is, shelter. For him, such tools and their uses filled the gap between his own time and distant antiquity. And here's the cover of Mercer's volume, Ancient Carpenter's Tools. So what's the Mercer legacy? Uh, what distinguishes Mercer's collecting from others in his era? Well, first, um, it should be noted that it was not, again, primarily aesthetic. He was not interested in the sort of good, better, best connoisseurship of art and design historians. It's true that he certainly had no compunctions about placing numbers you know, squarely on the face of objects. Some uh, today might consider that defacing the object, but he was interested in these objects as archaeological uh, evidence, uh, not just, although he was not insensitive to the aesthetics, not just uh, for their aesthetic value. And Mercer uh, stressed scientific collecting. He was, after all, truly a card-carrying member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. His objects were proofs or evidence of his thesis regarding the way we as humans develop tools to meet our wants and needs. And that process, he believed, had been a key driver of human history. He was also less interested in associative objects, a chair that Washington had sat in, uh, anything connected with famous people or places or events was less interesting to Mercer. His emphasis was also, again, on the vernacular, the things the folk used in their everyday lives, and he would expend as much effort to collect a needle as a pewter plate, a carved trade figure, or a piece of earthenware pottery, a high-style piece of furniture uh, little interested in. While he certainly would have collected, or could have collected, higher style, rarer or more decorative objects, he rather concentrated on the material culture of the middling and the mechanic classes, including their toys and playthings if they had any at all, in this case, a very crude uh, peg doll. Mercer started uh, with the tools of the nation maker, uh, but his collecting involved to be independent of any one nation. It grew increasingly anthropological. It was the study of man, as he noted in an early museum guide. And that led again to his uh, broadening his collecting scope and sending folks out to collect for him in the case of the basket at upper left uh, to West Africa or in the compass at lower right uh, to China. 
was the museum's collection was the history of man. Now, certainly Henry Mercer never conceived of himself as a folk art collector. It was not even a term that had come into vogue in his era, but he was certainly interested, <clears throat> again, in the tools, arts, and crafts of the folk. Um, and as such, he ultimately, ultimately would become one of the de facto leaders in folk art collecting, uh, as it would become recognized through the 1940s and 50s and 60s. And Mercer's collecting did ultimately lay the groundwork for the discovery of what would be called folk art, the, as distinguished again from high style, fine or academic art. But again, for Mercer, it was never art for art's sake. He placed all of his collecting in the service of developing a new way of doing history from the standpoint of objects, rather also than from documentary based history. He was a storyteller at heart and he placed his collection uh, and used his collection to tell stories and help people connect past and present. So Mercer and others in his era believed fervently in the power of objects to communicate. And the density of the collections housed in the museum still, much as they were in Mercer's time, attest to this idea that these things could speak to viewers. We still believe in the power of objects now, although we realize that more mediation is often needed as visitors are so far removed from the use of the tools and the other objects that are on exhibit. So what's become of collecting uh, at the Mercer Museum and Bucks County of Historical Society since Henry Mercer. Well, first it should be noted that collecting did not end with Mercer's uh, death in 1930. It continued emphasizing both local history as well as the broader history of life and work in pre-industrial America. And that's a trajectory we continue today, one that honors Mercer and his methods, but also doesn't omit objects associated with people, places and events in local Bucks County history. We are after all and continue to be the Bucks County Historical Society. Now, Horace Mann, Mercer's assistant curator, attempted to fill gaps in the collection, and there were gaps even after Mercer's death in 1930, as he took on Mercer's mantle um, uh, after uh, Mercer's passing. And one of those missing collections, just as an example, were glassmaking tools. And uh, here's a, a pair of glassmaker's shield, or shears that were acquired by, uh, by Mann. And local artifacts with stories like this quilt pieced and sewn by a grandmother and her granddaughter in 1830 have also long been incorporated into the collection, although they're a bit more opaque and obscure because they're not exhibited regularly in the Mercer Museum. But with the advent of our uh, so-called new wing in 2011 uh, and the changing exhibition gallery that was a key part of that, we're now able to utilize collections outside of the core of the museum that Mercer had filled and arranged. And we've had a whole variety of exhibits uh, in that gallery over the years and utilize some of these sort of hidden collections, our Fractor collection, um, our firefighting collection, for example. Now, having grown up in Doylestown, Henry Mercer considered that his museums, including his home, Fod Hill, and the collections contained within them to be gifts to the community. Mercer wrote that he could have built his museum anywhere, but he chose to build it in his hometown so that one day, as he said, students of these things would not go to Doylestown or not go to New York or elsewhere, but would be compelled to come to Doylestown. We're fortunate and delighted, of course, that they're still coming uh, today. So that concludes the presentation. Thank you all for listening, and I'd be happy to uh, entertain any questions about Mercer or the museum that folks might have. Corey, thank you so much. I always learn so much from every one of your talks, even when I think that I've heard it all before, I never have. Um, so as Corey said, we do have some time left. Um, if you all have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, and I will be happy to pose your questions to Corey. We already had one question that came in through, um, throughout the talk asking, has the museum had any religious or funeral artifacts that have been repatriated to Native American tribes or to other countries? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Yeah, when, when the... Uh... When NAGPRA, the, the Native American Graves and, and uh, Grave Protection and Repatriation Act was, was uh, passed, 
uh, quite a number of years ago, we did fairly extensive sort of searching through the collection to see what we might have that would fit within the, the guidelines of that act. Um, and we were concerned about a few um, human remains uh, that were in the collection. We took uh, all of them to uh, uh, forensic anthropologist at the uh, uh, the State Museum, the New Jersey State Museum in Trenton. He analyzed all of them and concluded all were uh, Caucasian, all were uh, European, um, and none were in fact Native American. Um, the only objects that we could identify at that point uh, and, and since then uh, in our collection that had any connection with graves or religious context, uh, uh, you know, and, and Native Americans, there were two uh, small shell beads uh, that all we knew uh, from the original cataloging was that they had come from uh, a grave uh, site in Snyder County, Pennsylvania. Uh, we declared those things, uh, we passed that information along, um, but there is nothing that ultimately uh, needed or was desired to be repatriated to, uh, uh, to uh, any uh, native or tribal organizations. Very interesting question. Thank you, Corey. Um, one question from in our um, chat here is asking, was Horace Mann the same Horace Mann for the New York City School? No, it's different. Different Horace Mans. Horace Michener Mann uh, was uh, was 100% Bucks County. <laughs> um, yeah, and he had he had come to to work for Mercer. Um, sort of forgetting now what he had done previously, but it had nothing to do with uh, uh, with material culture scholarship. Uh, but he had come to work for Mercer, uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, sort of uh, perpetuated Mercer's legacy uh, into well into the 1950s. Uh, and uh, my understanding, although I, I'm trying to remember now where I actually got this information, but my understanding was that he actually passed away at his desk in the museum um, in, the 19, uh, in the 1950s. So there was a dedicated guy. Quite the dedication. <laughs> Paul would like to know, where did Mercer's income come from to fund his collecting passion? Yeah. Yeah, so um, Mercer had the great good fortune, um, uh, even from his childhood, of having a very wealthy aunt, um, Elizabeth Chapman Lawrence, uh, his mother's sister, uh, had wed a wealthy Bostonian, a member of the Lawrence family of Massachusetts, um, and uh, her husband, uh, Aunt Elizabeth's husband, died very young, and Aunt Elizabeth had a wonderful time with his fortune for the rest of her life. Um, and she became, she was a, a socialite. She was uh, a, uh, um, uh, you know, someone who was very familiar with the social scene of the day. Many of the leading political figures, social figures uh, in Massachusetts, uh, in Washington and elsewhere, she had connections uh, and money. Uh, and so she helped fund um, Henry's and his brother and sister's education, their travels in Europe. Um, and, and ultimately helped get him started in the tile business uh, as well. Um, uh, she had, I mean, part of the reason that uh, there are Mercer tiles in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston is because uh, Aunt Elizabeth knew Isabella Stewart Gardner. So, um, so her connections really, uh, really helped Mercer tremendously, uh, as well as her money. And, uh, and her money helped uh, fund Fonts, the building of Font Hill as part of the reason that Mercer celebrated Elizabeth Chapman Lawrence, or EL, um, in, uh, in tile in, uh, in uh, some of the rooms at Font Hill, or in the Columbus room at Font Hill specifically. Um, so, uh, so, so that was really the key. And of course, once Mercer started producing tile, he was successful. Uh, and uh, he plowed uh, a lot of the profits from his tile making business directly into collecting. A lot of the receipts, some of the receipts that I, I used in this presentation actually came from the tile works records because he was buying things right out of the tile works uh, coffers, essentially. So turning those profits uh, right into his collecting. Very interesting. One question from Jean. Um, oh, two questions, actually. But could you please repeat what you said about the catalog numbers being on the surface of the objects? <laughs> and also, do you ever deaccession anything? And if so, what is the criteria? Yeah, great question. 
So as far as the catalog numbers are concerned, you know, Mercer, of course, uh, uh, was trained initially uh, and spent time as an archaeologist. So he was particularly interested in context and in, in, in readily connecting an object with its context. Um, uh, and so uh, when he began collecting objects uh, for um, uh, in his above ground collecting, uh, he had no qualms about putting an accession number directly where it was very visible uh, and easily associated and connected with uh, what were his original catalogs. And those catalogs, you know, were intended to be accessible to the scholars who he hoped would come and, and view the collection. So, so now, I suspect that that virtually none of the numbers were probably applied by Mercer himself. Some of them could have been, um, but others he probably had uh, people in his employ. And and I'm sure that not always did they make the best choices <laughs> in terms of where they put the numbers. We have numbers that are directly on the canvas, the canvases of, of paintings. Um, sometimes with a few little drips of white paint uh, going down the canvas. Um, but, uh, but the importance for Mercer was not so much the aesthetics of where the number was, but the fact that there was a number there that could be connected to the, to the history. Um, uh, regarding the accessioning, yes, um, uh, for many years, the museum uh, was essentially prohibited from deaccessioning. Mercer uh, included a clause in his will um, that nothing that he had collected and had given to the historical society could ever go outside of the walls of the historical society or the museum. Um, he was very concerned that things would be lost, that uh, things could be destroyed and, and what have you. Um, that was a provision when the years ago, around 1990, when the, the museum began to want to lend to other institutions and be part of sort of the community of museums, uh, we wanted to make sure we could do that. So through some legal action, that provision of Mercer's will was, uh, was formally uh, abrogated. Um, and uh, um, there was never really a prohibition per se on deaccessioning, uh, but we've always been very, very careful uh, not to uh, not to eat directly into a lot of what Mercer had acquired. Um, but more recently, I mean, we, we recognize that every museum recognizes that. Uh, uh, to be good custodians of its collection, it often cannot keep everything. A lot of what Mercer was acquiring, he was trying to rake stuff in as much as he could because he was fearful that things were going to be lost. He thought he was the only one who he was going to who was going to do any of this. As it turns out, he wasn't, but that's what he thought. Um, and so, um, so he was trying to collect as much as he could. And along the way, he collected things that were sometimes broken, that were sometimes incomplete, that were sometimes um, not entirely what he thought they were, um, and, and what have you. So more recently, we have done uh, deaccessioning. We always do it through a very transparent process through our collections committee, uh, through the board of trustees. Um, we are very careful not to deaccession things that have particular histories associated with them, um, uh, or things that are are uh, uh, important for a variety of purposes. But things that are duplicates, things that are broken, things that have limited utility uh, in our collection, things that are out of scope, um, because in, in Mercer's era, the museum was collecting natural history materials. You know, we 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 are no longer see ourselves as a natural history museum. So over the years, we've deaccessioned things that meet some of those criteria: out of scope, um, uh, uh, poor condition, um, uh, no histories. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, in fact, we're just in the process now of deaccessioning some. Um, uh, some textile working tools uh, in the collection. So it is a, it is a process uh, that we go through, uh, like every museum, uh, very carefully. Um, and it's primarily to refine our collection. We're certainly not looking to to make money off of the deaccessioning. Uh, it's really a, a process of, of uh, making space available. Yes. I hope that answers that question in a, in a long-winded sort of way. Very interesting question, yeah. Uh, one more question that I see here in our um, chat is asking, how did Henry Mercer die? So Mercer had a number of, of, of uh, illnesses and infirmaries, infirmities during his lifetime, uh, some of which at least were probably rooted uh, in um, the gonorrhea that he had contracted as a young man. Some of them may have been associated with uh, the malaria that he apparently contracted when he was in the Yucatan. 
Uh, so uh, that's part of the reason that he just didn't, he didn't travel very much in the last 20 or so years of, uh, or 30 years of his life. Uh, he just couldn't. Um, uh, he really pretty much kept to, uh, kept to Fod Hill and, and, uh, and Bucks County. He was actually invited, I think it was in 19, I remember it was 1928, I think, to speak to the uh, then the American Association of Museums. It would have been interesting to see what he would have said, um, but uh, but he couldn't uh, he couldn't go. So eventually, all of the the various illnesses and infirmities got the better of him, um, and he died essentially of of, of heart and kidney failure um, uh, at Font Hill in March of 1930. Yeah. Uh, Vaughn has a question asking, does Henry Mercer have any family descendants and do they have a relationship with the museum? Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, no. I mean, uh, Mercer uh, did not have any surviving uh, offspring that we are aware of. Um, his brother, William, uh, and his wife had uh, uh, twin, had twins, I think twin sons, if I'm remembering correctly, who unfortunately passed away in infancy. Uh, his, um, his sister, Layla, uh, and her husband, um, uh, Hubert uh, von Eserborn, the family lived in, in Europe, uh, in Austria. Um, uh, they had one daughter. Um, who did survive and did marry, and there are descendants of that offspring. I believe the last time I tried to track anyone down, they're, they're somewhere in England. <laughs> um, some Many years ago, there was a, um, a descendant uh, who came uh, to, uh, to the U.S., who came to Doylestown, uh, but then again, that's all through uh, his sister's family and not through his own. Uh, we know or believe uh, that Mercer did father a child out of wedlock um, in Europe. Um, he is paying some degree of, of support for that child in a in a uh, uh, in an orphanage uh, and uh, in uh, around just before World War One. But we don't know whatever happened to that child. That's the whole story right there. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, a few people just saying thank you for such a great presentation and for wonderful photos in the presentation as well. Um, and Jean said great answer on deaccessioning, really interesting and not too long winded. <laughs> I loved seeing the plane used to build Buckingham Friends. I have ancestors who worshiped there. My favorite object from a grade school trip to the museum was the Conestoga wagon. I was fascinated by it hanging from the ceiling. Well, keep being fascinated, everyone. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in. So with that, um, Corey, thank you so much for spending time with us today um, and, and providing this very interesting talk. Um, we're so glad that everyone could join us. And to all of you who joined us today, thank you so much. As always, keep an eye on our website or um, join our e-newsletter if you're interested in hearing about future programs that we are offering um, and other virtual lectures. So with that, we will conclude and I will say thank you all. Have a wonderful day.